order members, the sitting is resumed. Colin McGrath is not in his place. I call Patsy McLone. Uh, Kesh Devon Dahl, question number two. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The limitations placed on the courts by the COVID-19 pandemic inevitably led to a decline in the number of family court receipts and disposals. However, the reduction in receipts was less marked than those seen in other business areas. A huge amount of work has been ongoing across the justice system to respond to and recover from the very significant impacts of COVID-19. All courthouses, with the exception of the three smallest hearing centres, have reopened. In addition, virtual courtroom capacity has been significantly increased, with video conferencing technology being deployed to facilitate remote and hybrid hearings. The published statistics show that between July and December 2020, the number and length of children order court sittings increased compared with the same period in 2019. Consequently, the average number of children order cases being dealt with currently exceeds pre-lockdown levels by around 10 per cent. The listing of court business is, of course, a judicial function. The Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service continue to work closely with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice with a view to increasing the amount of court business that can be progressed while complying with the public health guidance. I call Patsy McGlone for something. Uh, Ida. Thanks very much, Minister. Um, could I just ask the Minister, does she foresee any additional rollout of the use of technology on a more permanent basis in these settings? With respect to the use of technology, obviously there have been some challenges with the introduction of that, which was done at pace. However, it would be our intention that where we have been able to establish good protocols for working in that technology, that we would maintain the technology post-COVID. There have been a number of benefits for that, both for those um, who are bringing their cases to court because it may provide a more accessible form of justice, but also in terms of cost to the justice system, for example, in the criminal sphere, uh, where we can reduce the cost of remand hearings and particularly prisoner transportation. I think it's important that where we do find benefits through COVID of being able to accelerate the modernisation process in the courts and in the justice system, that we should try to grasp those and ensure that they're embedded well going forward. Thank you. Call Jerry Kelly. I listened to the minister speaking there, and I suppose she has uh, touched on the question I was going to ask. If she has had any conversations with the, the health minister in terms of better outcomes in the court system. So while we are dealing with the pandemic, I understand that and, and welcome the technology that has been used uh, going ahead. But are you looking at it in a holistic way, if I could put it that way, post-COVID uh, in terms of the... Uh, the, the court system and for getting better outcomes, obviously, especially for disputes amongst uh, parents. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, technology is one element of it, but as you know, we are also looking to introduce um, assisted um, opportunities for mediation between um, couples as well, in order to try to avoid the kind of family disputes. Um, that arrive in court and are often quite acrimonious and very sensitive. So I think that there are a number of things we can do, first of all, to better support families as they have to go through the court system, but also to try to support families before they get to the court system. I think that's crucial as well, because I think most of us would recognise that the breakdown of a relationship is an incredibly stressful time, both for the parents and for children particularly, and therefore it's important that any differences between the adults are dealt with in a way that is child-centred and child-focused. And I think the best way forward for that is via mediation as opposed to necessarily through the courts. Moving on, I call William Irwin. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Justice McAlinden was formally appointed as President of the Victims Payment Board by the Lord Chief Justice on 1 March 2021. A total of 26 legal, medical and lay members have also now been appointed to the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission by the Victims Payments Board. Members of the board have been undergoing an, in an induction and training programme, as well as considering a range of issues to progress implementation of the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. I am very grateful for the commitment of the President and members of the Victims Payment Board to making the scheme operational, and I very much welcome the announcement by the President this morning of his intention that the scheme will open for applications on 30 June. I believe that this is good news for victims and survivors of the Troubles who have waited a very long time for this important scheme to be introduced. I call William Irwin. Can I thank the Minister for her response? Can I ask the Minister if she is aware if a criteria has been set uh, for, to identify those eligible for the scheme? 
Well, the member will be aware that the criteria um, and the regulations around this were set by the Secretary of State, uh, who set the eligibility um, criteria for the scheme. The Victims Payment Regulations 2020 provide that a person is not entitled to a victim's payment where they were, wholly, or where they were convicted of conduct which caused the incident wholly or in part, where the Board considers that the person's relevant conviction makes entitlement to victim's payments inappropriate, or where the President of the Board considers that exceptional circumstances of the case, having regard to material evidence, make entitlement to victims' payments inappropriate. The Secretary of State has also issued guidance regarding the circumstances in which a relevant conviction or exceptional circumstance would make entitlement to victims' payments inappropriate. It would not be appropriate for me to comment on eligibility for the scheme or the interpretation of that guidance, as that is very much a responsibility of the Victims' Payment Board themselves. They will be independent and should be free to make their decisions based on the regulations and guidance provided. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, Minister, could you advise if you have been given any indication of the potential numbers of applicants and the cost of the scheme and speak more to the money behind the scheme? Well, as the member will be aware, the issue um, of addressing the numbers of applicants um, is something that has been taken forward by the Executive Office, um, who retain, if you like, full responsibility um, for delivery of schemes for victims. Um, however, the funding required to deliver the scheme obviously will be dependent um, on the number of applicants that actually come forward. It is also important to bear in mind that decisions on awards will be made by an independent panel, and so that also um, is, is not entirely clear in terms of what those awards might be. The Government Actuaries Department has been engaged by the Executive Office to give a range of possible costings for the lifetime of the scheme, taking account of the full lifespan and a range of factors, including, for example, backdating and the number of people who may opt to take a lump sum for 10 years rather than receiving their pension um, on an ongoing basis. The estimates of total cost of payments from the GAD report range from £600 million to £1.2 billion with a central estimate of around £848 million before administration costs are added. It is important to note that while the GAD report provides indicative figures for the scheme, there are major uncertainties over some fundamental factors um, in the scheme relating to the numbers injured, the degree and permanence of their disability, and also the choices that will be made by applicants that make the costs uncertain. These will therefore need to be refined as we go. With respect to um, the funding being made available, the member will also be aware of a recent court ruling, uh, which has made it clear that that funding um, will have to be made, and also of the undertaking by TEO that they will provide that funding um, in consultation with the Department of Finance. All of the executive remain of a mind that this is a matter in which the Secretary of State and the NIO have some responsibility, given that they drew up um, the eligibility criteria for the scheme. And we continue to meet with him. Um, and whilst that has not always been fruitful, um, we have agreed to meet again at a point where we will have a better idea of the application profile um, at the end of the year, in the hope that we can review and revise the offer uh, which he has already made, which I think most members of this House would consider to be uh, less than adequate. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, I'm going to thank the, the Minister for the information given so far around this scheme. Um, there have been a number of victims who have already died before being able to make application to the scheme, and others who regrettably may die before the scheme becomes operational. Can I ask the Minister what provision uh, there is within the scheme for these victims? The Victims Payment Regulations 2020 includes provision for an applicant to have nominated a beneficiary to receive a payment should they die after um, submitting their application. There is also provision in the regulations for the Board to decide if someone may apply to receive such payments in the event no such person has been nominated. The regulations also provide for posthumous applications and as such will ensure that in cases where an individual who would have been entitled to victims payments but passed away before being able to make an application that they would be able um, to be made by a person um, the deceased may have nominated under the regulations. I call Doug Beattie. Speaker, and, and Minister, apologies, I, I was late in coming in and didn't hear your previous answers uh, in regards to this, but um, I, I welcome the news that uh, the, the permanent disablement payment scheme uh, will be open for applications in, in June. Could, could the Minister outline, even at, at, at best, um, when it's likely to start paying out? 
Well, I mean, I'm not going to say that that's as, as trying to estimate how long is a piece of string, but there are obviously a number of issues um, that will feed into that um, in terms of when we're actually likely to be in a position um, to receive payments. It is, I agree with the member, a very positive development that the President has now indicated his intention that the scheme will open for applications on the 30th of June. I think that's a key milestone for many of the people who have been waiting for this. It is a complex scheme and a number of operational issues are being processed um, in advance of the scheme opening for applications and that includes the design of the medical assessment service by Capita. It will ultimately, ultimately be a matter for the Victims Payment Board to confirm when payments may be made from the scheme, but it will depend obviously on the number of applications and their complexity. I'm aware, however, that the President and the Victims Payment Board are committed to ensuring that applications will be processed as expeditiously as possible, and I think that all of those applying for the scheme will very much welcome that commitment. I call Linda Dillon. Can Corley, thank you. Thank the Minister for her answers so far. Could the Minister confirm, obviously, we are on the record around the eligibility criteria and our concerns around that, but could the Minister confirm that there will be a good communication strategy with the victim sector? Because we welcome the announcement today, but I know from our experience with HIA that that is vital in any of these processes, that victims know what is happening, when it is happening and why it is happening. Well, I agree with the member entirely. It's been one of the priorities um, when I took over the, the responsibility for delivering the scheme. And so we have had regular meetings with the victim sector. Um, we have also written um, information to them so that they can share that with their constituent members. And we've also then be able to share, been able to share that information on our website and DOJ so that other members who may not be linked to any of the advocacy groups will still have the same information um, and updates. We also have where people have contacted us proactively asking for further information, retained um, with their permission um, their contacts in order that when the scheme opens they can be notified of any progress on an ongoing basis. And further, we are funding um, advocates to work within the sector. They will be based in some of the existing organisations but will be there for the support and guidance of anyone wishing to make an application. So communication is crucial and I have to say that um, Justice McAlinden has been really clear that he also values that communication and indeed has now met, I think, with each of the victim sector organisations on at least two occasions in person in order to ensure that he is able to maintain their trust and cooperation throughout this process. I think we all recognise that one of the big frustrations for many members while they were awaiting this scheme coming forward was that often they got no feedback at all about where things were. We have been very candid and have operated on a, a basis of no surprises. So if we know there's a difficulty or a challenge, we're very upfront with people, and I think they appreciate that candour um, and have also been incredibly helpful to us when we have needed their guidance or assistance to take things forward. And could we have Declan McAleer onto our screens, please? Um, Declan Declan Margaret, uh, Kester Rajahar, question number four. As I announced last month, I intend to strengthen the current law on abuse of positions of trust by extending its scope beyond those responsible for our young people within the statutory sector. This will be achieved through amendment of the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill during the course of its passage in the Assembly later this year. While I can reiterate my commitment to offer greater protection across a broader range of environments in the non-statutory setting, I cannot be specific at this early stage as to how extensive that will be. My officials have begun work in developing in this area in consultation with stakeholders, including the NSPCC, and are taking account of the, experiencing, the experience of neighbouring jurisdictions to ensure that informed, well-targeted and workable legislation is achieved. While I am very conscious of the specific impacts identified in the area of sport and within the religious sector, I am mindful that this type of predatory behaviour can occur in other environments where an adult has significant influence or power over a young person in their care. It is therefore important that we take steps to identify, as far as is possible, such other areas as need to be covered by the proposed legislation. That said, it is imperative that we make robust law which is able to withstand scrutiny and challenge in the courts, so as to ensure there is no wiggle room for offenders. It is equally important that we do not create a law which has the effect of criminalising people unnecessarily, and in this respect it is crucial that we get it right and that the legal definition that applies in law strikes a proportionate balance. As Minister, I also want to ensure that in protecting our young people, we can also safeguard their ability to enter into healthy sexual relationships, 
Enabling this will require a collaborative cross-sectoral approach, and this is very much guiding my department's approach. I call Declan McAleer for supplementary. Uh, Gurma, I would thank the uh, Minister for uh, her, her answer. Uh, Minister, you, you are aware that the current uh, Abuse of Trust laws contains a loophole which effectively uh, enables the grooming of uh, 16 and 17 year olds by people or adults who are in positions of power. Uh, do, you, do you agree that the legislation should be broadened to cover all circumstances uh, where an adult is entrusted with the power over a 16 and 17 year old? Gurma, I think that there are complexities as people reach adulthood and go through that transitional phase in their lives in terms of the degree to which the state can intervene in their individual choices. However, I absolutely agree that while they remain a minor, it is important that they are able to be protected um, from grooming and from abuse. And therefore, it's, uh, that's one of the areas uh, which the department will be looking at incredibly carefully, along with those in other jurisdictions who have brought forward similar legislation in terms of trying to understand the particular approaches that they have taken and indeed the areas where they feel that the legislation could be strengthened. It's also fair to say that it would be our intention at this stage, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, when we bring forward this amendment um, to also create the capacity um, for additional sectors to be added without the need for further primary legislation, because I believe that it is important that we are agile in our response um, to this particular threat. I call Rachel Woods. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far, um, and also with the engagement um, that her department has had with the Justice Committee in relation to the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the possible date of introduction of the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill to the Northern Ireland Assembly? Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, you will appreciate that were I to give a date for introduction uh, before the Speaker had given me one, um, that I would be in significant trouble with the Speaker. However, I can assure the member that we are still on target um, to bring the, the legislation in May. That is still the intention. It is subject, of course, to approval from the Executive, which I am in the process of seeking at the moment, and subject to a date being set by the Business Committee and the Speaker. Um, but certainly, from my perspective, we are ready to go. And I call Christopher Stelford. Question number five, Mr Deputy Speaker. As of the 15th of April 2021, 17 individuals convicted of terrorism offences were in custody in Northern Ireland prisons. I call Christopher Stelford. Last year, the Minister revealed to the House, in response to a question from the member from North Antrim, Mr Alistair, that the separated prison, prison regime is costing roughly £2 million a year out of the Department of Justice budget. Given that that policy originates from the Northern Ireland office, should it not be the Northern Ireland office that is picking up this tab rather than the Minister's own department? Well, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I think there are two issues. First of all, um, there are more people within the separated regime than those convicted of terrorism offences, um, and indeed there are some convicted of terrorism offences who are not within the separated regime. However, the decision as to whether or not people are eligible to enter into the separated regime is, as the member says, um, a decision for the Secretary of State. Um, I would like us to move to a position where we no longer have a separated regime, um, but I am very cognisant of the challenges that that um, will create, both within the prisons and within the community. And so we need to approach this in a sensitive and a thoughtful way. I do, however, agree wholeheartedly with the member um, that the Secretary of State's uh, intervention in terms of the funding um, of the separated regime would be more than welcome, particularly at a time where, where, other justice, uh, where other justice delivery is facing significant financial pressure. I call Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, and, and I thank the Minister for, for her observations to date. I'd be grateful for her update on her thinking of the merits of allowing those convicted of terrorist offences to continue to serve their sentences in segregated regimes. And to be clear, that's the merits for this society, not for those prisoners. Um, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are a number of elements to this. First and foremost, um, there is the issue of the security and stability within the prison. There is the issue of the rehabilitation of the offenders themselves. Um, and there is also the impact on the wider community. I personally believe that the organisations to which some of these people ascribe loyalty should no longer exist in our society, and it's part of the work of all of us in this chamber to ensure um, that that becomes the case. But that requires all of us, I think, to do work outside the prisons, not merely inside the prisons, in terms of tackling um, the existence of such organisations. 
We continue to work within the prison system um, and within uh, the segregated um, regime that is set up to try to normalise um, as far as is possible the regime within that system. It would not be recognisable as it might have been at other times in the past. Um, and we continue to deliver um, the requirements of the tackling paramilitarism programme during this time. Our focus is clear. We strive to offer an equivalent level of education and constructive activity within the separated regime to that available within the integrated regime. It would be my preference that all prisoners were integrated, but as I said in my previous answer, I think that that is something that is an outside-in solution as opposed to an inside-out solution. I call Matthew Tull. Deputy Speaker, Minister, do you know or have you asked if anyone convicted of terrorist offences currently uh, serving in Northern Ireland prisons or indeed anyone out on licence, if there has been any information to link them to uh, recent disorder that we've seen on our streets? And if that were found to be the case, what would be the consequences that you would expect to see? Well, it is the case that the PSNI have given an assessment that they do not believe that the recent disorder has been orchestrated by paramilitary organisations, although there were visible paramilitary members, um, known members of those organisations, visible on the ground at some points in that disorder. It would not be a decision for me as to what would happen to individuals um, who breached their licence conditions. That would be a matter um, for um, the... That would be a matter... Um, my mind's just gone blank. Um, that would be a matter um, for uh, the courts um, rather than for me. Um, but obviously, um, anyone who breaches their licence condition um, could face a return um, to prison. They could face conviction for further offences, but they could also face having to serve out the rest of their sentence. Moving on, I call Paul Free. Six, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We're all too aware of how tackling domestic abuse has become even more important in recent times. Victims of domestic abuse should not feel forgotten or alone, particularly during these challenging times. And it is vital that they know help and support continues to be available from our voluntary community sector partners, and in particular from the Domestic and Sexual Abuse Helpline 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I've always been very clear that the issue of funding domestic and sexual abuse services is and should uh, be not one solely for the Department of Justice. Rather, it's a cross-cutting executive issue. There is a need for the executive to support the cross-cutting work that needs to be taken forward to comprehensively address this issue. A range of domestic and sexual violence and abuse services are funded by a number of government departments, including my own, with around £7.5 million spent annually. My department has funded or partly funded a number of initiatives, including the 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline, behavioural change programmes, domestic homicide reviews, independent sexual violence advisors, the See the Science Multimedia Awareness Raising Campaign, and funding to policing and community safety partnerships for domestic and sexual abuse initiatives. Funding for a number of these initiatives involve voluntary sector partners who are key to work in this area, including in developing the new domestic abuse offence legislation. Going forward, a new advocacy support service to be delivered by Women's Aid and Men's Advisory Project will be introduced in September. My department is also working closely with voluntary sector partners in developing an e-learning package on the new offence and will involve voluntary sector partners in the new multimedia public awareness raising campaign to ensure there are no hidden voices and that we reach the most vulnerable in our society. I call Paul Frey. Thank you, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her comprehensive answer. I really do appreciate it. Uh, given that lockdown has impacted greatly on unfortunate victims and people who are being placed in further danger because of the lockdown, uh, and given the fact that support groups are having to work through operational matters in a more arduous way because of lockdown, uh, is it time, given the, the Minister's answer, about the cross-cutting nature and the all-embracing impact that it has on victims, that we maybe strengthen the programme for government to assist victims in some way to, if nothing else, raise awareness for them, but also for the departments within this executive? Well, of course, the member will be aware from his work in the committee um, that tackling domestic violence and abuse is a priority within the programme for government and a strategic priority um, for the executive. And we do have a seven-year strategy in order to tackle that. With respect to funding, obviously, I believe that funding needs to follow form. And therefore, if we say something is a priority, we need to fund it as though it is a priority. 
Um, it is considered, of course, um, in terms of the funding, that there is a challenge um, around how we actually um, ensure that we introduce new support mechanisms, but also that we adequately fund them. Where the department has introduced new um, schemes and has introduced new services, we do fund the, the organisations for those, but they also will benefit from a cocktail of funding, for example, by providing services um, for other departments that, inter that intersect uh, with the domestic abuse space. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers so far. Minister, would you agree that early intervention prevention is key to combating domestic violence and abuse? And, and with that said, um, can you advise when you anticipate the new advertising campaign for the new um, domestic abuse offences um, will go live? Thank you. Um, I don't have a date um, for that new campaign, but I know that work on that is well underway. We are working um, in terms of trying to work with our um, public sector um, and private sector partners in order to try to raise awareness. Um, as you know, domestic abuse can affect anyone, and so it's very important um, that we address this in the round and that we actually look at tr trying to raise, I suppose, some of the hidden voices around domestic abuse. Um, the intention is that the further multimedia advertising campaign, when developed, will actually we will be consulting on that with our voluntary and statutory partners um, to ensure that it is reflective of the wider issues that have been raised. And then once that is done, it will be delivered across a range of platforms. But at this stage, I don't actually have a, a date for that to be launched. I'd be happy to update the member when that becomes available. I call Dolores Kelly. Deputy Speaker, and I support uh, you, Minister, in your assessment of it being a cross-cutting issue. Uh, there had been an, an advocacy service plan for later this year. I wonder, could you provide the House with an update? Yes, I'm more than happy to do so. The advocacy service we had hoped would be in place um, sooner. We had hoped that we would be able to get a consortium approach um, in terms of dealing with that, um, and we worked with our voluntary sector partners in order to try to develop that, but unfortunately it was not successful. So we had to then go out to um, public procurement, which has slowed the process down somewhat. However, the advocacy um, service that we have now procured, I believe, is robust. Um, I believe it will be very helpful um, to victims, and it will be introduced in September of this year. Moving on, I call Trevor Clark. Number seven. The scheduling of court listings and listings of business is a judicial function. Since September, courts have resumed sitting at almost all venues and all types of court business has, rec has recommenced. Only the three smallest hearing centres now remain closed. As much business as possible is being heard remotely or in the form of a hybrid hearing, as directed by the judge. Small claim applications continue to be processed during the pandemic, including, where appropriate, the issuing of default judgments. From the 12th of April, a dedicated small claims court <coughs> has been held in the Nightingale Ligon every Monday to Wednesday. Furthermore, from the 6th of May, another dedicated small claims court will be held in Downpatrick each Thursday and Friday. These additional small claims courts will be presided over by a deputy district judge. Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service continues to work closely with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice with a view to increasing the amount of court business that can be progressed. All court business activity is taking place only after it has been subject to necessary risk assessments in consultation with the Public Health Agency and Health and Safety Executive, as well as other statutory agencies. I call Trevor Clark. I uh, welcome the answer from the Justice Minister in relation to that, and I am sure she would appreciate that many small businesses suffer greatly because of the loss of the opportunity to actually take cases to the small claims. I welcome the fact that there has been some provision made whilst it is only on 12 April this year, but can the uh, Justice Minister outline when she thinks that the provision for those people, particularly the small claims, who it is in many other cases it's their only hope, when all avenues will be open for them to use as pre-COVID? Well, as I said out earlier, actually, in the majority of cases throughout the court system, we are now processing more business uh, than we processed immediately pre-lockdown. So we are actually starting now to eat into the backlog, and that is hugely important that we are able to do that. We also um, have activity now um, in terms of our review um, of the small claims court, because obviously one of the reasons why the small claims court is not accessible to some people is because it has quite a low threshold in terms of its jurisdiction. We are actually out to consultation on that at the moment with view to potentially raising that jurisdiction so that more small businesses, independent traders and others may be able to actually get their business transacted through the Small Claims Court. Small Claims Court is actually an impressive part of the justice system here. It is much faster in, um, in delivering its judgments um, and on processing business than in any other part of these islands. 
And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. Could we have Daniel McCrossan on our screens, please? Thank you, Mr. And I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answers to uh, the questions so far. Uh, Minister, it's been 22 years since the Oma bomb killed 29 people, including a pregnant woman uh, with twins. The families who put their lives on hold still await a much-needed public inquiry. Does the Minister agree with me uh, and the families that a public inquiry is absolutely necessary? And could she explain which conversation, what conversation she has had with the Secretary of State, uh, Brandon Lewis, in that regard? Well, the member will be aware um, of my party's position with respect to this, and we would very much um, support the, the issue of a public inquiry. However, it would not be appropriate for me as Justice Minister to comment further on the matter, um, given that I think it would be seen as prejudging the outcome of any inquiry and potentially uh, um, could be prejudicial. It would be fair to say that when it comes to issues such as public inquiries and the wider legacy piece, I have many conversations um, with the Secretary of State. Um, I get few answers um, that are worth repeating in the chamber, unfortunately. Call Daniel McCrossan. Sorry to hear that, Minister. I'm glad you share uh, our frustration in that regard. You, you'll know uh, that families uh, have put their lives on hold and search for truth and justice, particularly in OMA, which is one of the worst atrocities uh, of the Troubles. Uh, Minister, will you commit at, your, at the earliest convenience uh, post uh, lockdown post restrictions to meet with the OMA families with me uh, and give an assurance that you, in your capacity as Minister, uh, will leave no stone unturned to assist the families of OMA on their search for truth and justice. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I would have no qualms whatsoever in agreeing to such a meeting um, and meeting with people who I feel have shown an incredible amount of restraint and dignity in their campaign. Um, and I would be more than happy to meet with them and indeed with other victims um, if they feel that it is of benefit to them. It, of course, has to be reiterated that I cannot interfere um, in cases that go before the courts or that are before inquiries for, for fear of prejudicing the outcome. But I'm always more than happy, where possible, um, to meet with victims. And I would be happy to accede to any such request. Moving on, I call Cahill Boylan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister provide an update on her meeting with the British Secretary of State last week in relation to her request for additional police funding as a result of ongoing violence against the PSNI from power military groups and also crime gangs? Well, I thank the member for his question, and if he will indulge me, and if you will indulge me, um, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to take the opportunity. Um, again, to condemn the recent attack on a young mother um, who was serving her community. Um, thankfully, no one was injured, um, but it could have been a very different outcome had that officer not been so vigilant. Police officers continue to be at significant risk, and I want to commend their courage and their bravery as they try to protect the community against the backdrop of a terrorist threat. I also recognise that there is a huge amount of pressure on the police at this time um, in terms of the recent um, the recent disturbances that we have seen, and also in terms um, of policing other public order issues. Given that the police have come under such incredible pressure, um, I want to be clear of my unequivocal support um, to them in the work that they do. When I met the Secretary of State this week, we discussed the general security situation and the types of challenge that the PSNI are currently facing, which, as we know, has been brought into sharp relief um, for those working on the front line of recent days. PSNI's final budget allocation for 2021-22 from the Executive, which is still subject to vote by an Assembly, along with an in-year allocation of £12.3 million, will enable the PSNI not only to retain their current number of officers, but also to increase them to 7,100 by the end of this financial year, making a, a, a gesture, at least, towards moving in the direction of the NDNA commitments. I spoke with the Secretary of State and I said that I intend to keep open the dialogue both with him and with the Chief Constable regarding the PSNI's requirements in respect of additional security funding in order to ensure that the police are properly resourced both for their day-to-day -day work in communities and also dealing with an incredibly difficult security situation. <coughs> I call Cahill Boylan for supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for her answer. But would the Minister agree with me that there is no place for violence against the PSNI and that the policing board and our democratic accountability structures are the correct place to raise concerns around policing. I agree, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is important as politicians 
um, that we recognise the pressures that the PSNI face. That does not mean that the PSNI are perfect or beyond criticism, but it is also incumbent on each of us to work with them to try and build trust and confidence in the structures that we have. And that means that where we do have issues for complaint or inquiry, we should take them through the appropriate mechanisms. No violence in our society is acceptable. No violence against the PSNI is acceptable or excusable or defensible. And I call Liz Kimmins. Um, Minister, can you give an update on your consideration of the hate crime review, given that it was published uh, almost six months ago? I thank the member um, for her question, and I will take this opportunity, if I may, also to condemn um, the recent attack against the Syrian refugee family um, in Uri, um, in her own con constituency. I also want to attack the um, attacks on Jewish graves in Belfast City Cemetery. Racism um, and intolerance um, and hate um, that result in these negative behaviours is a blight on our society and we need to address it. It is particularly heinous to attack those in minority communities for their perceived differences given their significant contribution um, to Northern Ireland. With respect um, to the issues involved, they are incredibly complex. And so I agree with Judge Marnon that his recommendations um, merit a standalone hate crime bill that is planned for introduction in the next mandate to allow for proper consideration of the policy areas and public con uh, consultation where some of those proposals are novel. In the meantime, work on non-legislative recommendations and those relating to reserve matters has commenced, including providing a sustainable hate crime advocacy service to support victims of hate crime, creating a Victims of Crime Commissioner, which should have a particular focus on hate crime and domestic violence, and also working with the UK Government on online hate issues as part of their wider online safety bill. It is hugely important as we go forward that we make sure that our legislation is fit for purpose um, and hopefully um, we will be able to make progress on the drafting um, of that hate crime legislation and the consultation um, on the various elements of it um, towards the end of this mandate in preparation for the new mandate. I call Liz Kimmins. Morgan, I thank the Minister for answering. It is good to hear the, the progress in terms of that. And I think uh, you know, it, it, it is unrealistic to, to um, say that the hate crime bill will be achieved during this mandate, and, and you have outlined that even the preparation for the next mandate, and that is good to hear. And I thank you for your comments um, in relation to the attack on my own constituency, and I also echo them in relation to the, the Jewish graves in Belfast City Cemetery. On that, I suppose, um, Minister, can you outline what work is being done in the here and now by your department to, to try and tackle some of these attacks? Um, you know, obviously, as, as we wait for this legislation to uh, come through. Thank you. Well, I mean, clearly there is already um, the opportunity for crimes to be um, investigated and recorded as hate crime, and it is important that that continues. There's also work ongoing um, with, our, with our partners in order to try to support through the advocacy service. Um, to support people who want to come forward and make a complaint and encourage people to have confidence in the justice system so they feel empowered to do that. Um, so all of those things are ongoing in order to try and here and now to help people, but there is more to it than that. We need, I, think that I think the analogy is we need to stop pulling bodies out of the river and move upstream and find out why they're falling in. And I think we need to get upstream of this problem and actually look um, and see is there something that we can be doing um, as a society to tackle the underlying prejudice in our communities. I think that's a job for all of us, but I know um, in working, for example, with the Communities Minister, who is looking at a series of strategies, strategies that will deal particularly with minority groups, but also um, those who are subject to hate crime, whether that's racial equality, um, strategy and action plan, the LGBTQI um, strategy and action plan, or others. I think there is an opportunity in the work that we do on a cross-executive basis um, to continue continue to try to change attitudes, because ultimately, when people arrive with us, they have already suffered harm. What I want to do is work with other ministers to try to prevent that harm taking place. And I call Philip McWigan. Can, call you. Uh, can I ask the minister if she will give her assessment of last week's Sugenity report, uh, which criticised the slow progress uh, in implementing recommendations aimed at improving do domestic abuse services? Well, I thank the member um, for his question. Um, with respect to the Sugeni report, I think, first of all, it is incredibly important um, that, unlike other departments, um, my department is scrutinised on a regular basis by an external body. I only wish that it were true of all ministers. 
Um, and therefore, it's important that when we are scrutinised in that way, um, that we take the time to digest um, the comments within the report. In actual fact, the report was much less critical, I would have to say, than the press release which accompanied it, uh, if I might be so bold. Um, I think that if you actually read it, it's a much more balanced report with respect to the significant progress that has been made in this space. Um, considering the pressures that the Department has faced with COVID in the prisons, in the courts, um, and indeed uh, within our other service delivery areas, um, I am also confident that the areas which were highlighted that haven't yet been delivered, for example, the new advocacy service um, and the domestic violence court pilot, are areas that we could not have progressed any quicker. I mean, in the context where we are challenged um, in the court system already, it is incredibly difficult to pilot new initiatives. However, I am pleased um, to say that that will be happening. Um, in, the, in the autumn in both cases. So whilst there has been some delay, um, I don't believe that there has been, if you like, any taking the foot off the pedal. And I have to say, if I may, Mr um, Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to pay tribute to my staff because whilst I am passionate about this issue, that is matched every day by the passion of the people who work in this particular area. Um, they are absolutely committed to delivering um, in this area and to ensuring that those who are subject to domestic abuse or violence have all the support um, and all the recourse to justice that they need. I call Philip McGuigan for supplement. Uh, Arish, uh, Minister, the implementation plan to deliver the recommendations from the Gillen Review of Serious Sexual Offences cases uh, in July last year revealed that only 11 per cent of the recommendations had at that point been implemented. So I hear what you're saying in terms of the balance of the Sajini report and the press statement, but I mean, can I ask you if you agree that much more could and should be done uh, in a quicker fashion to uh, implement the outstanding recommendations? No, I don't believe that more could be done, but I would agree that more should be done, which is why we continue to work on these issues. Um, in order to say that more could be done would suggest that we are currently not working at full capacity, and that is simply not my experience of the Department. Um, we have already four bills, one act completed, three bills before the House and another bill to come. That, that last bill, the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, the Justice Bill, will come um, in May, and it will cover many of the legislative aspects um, of Sir John Gillan's review. I keep in regular contact with Sir John Gillan, um, and I update him regularly on the work that he has done, not just around serious sexual offences, um, but also the work that he did in terms of civil and family justice and courts, uh, where I recently outlined progress that we're making in that, uh, in that regard, um, with respect to his much wider review um, of the civil um, and family justice system. It is important that members realise that the Department of Justice is not immune to the impacts of COVID either. We are unique. Um, in, in these islands in terms of being able to keep our prisons largely COVID free. We have had no major outbreaks. Um, no one, thank God, has passed away within the prison system. That has, that has taken up a, an immense amount of capacity. We have also been able to rebuild our courts and anyone who wishes um, to see that, I would encourage them to get a tour of the work that has been done so that our courts are COVID secure physically um, as well as everything else. That comes at a cost. We have also um, been supporting other um, departments in the work that they do um, around COVID, including um, legislating um, and regulations. So I think could more be done? I think not in the current circumstances. Should more be done? Absolutely. And by the end of this mandate, it will be. I call Melissa McHugh. Uh, Minister, I'm sure that you would actually agree with me that uh, virtual prison visits, while it's necessary, we'll say, as a temporary measure, but they're far from ideal. And can you give us an update uh, when in-person visits uh, might be uh, recommenced? In-person visits will start um, on the 4th of May. Um, it will be for adults only at this stage, but we will continue to monitor um, levels of transmission in the community and hopefully then to be able to relax some of the restrictions around those in-person visits as we move forward. We will also be maintaining virtual visits because for some, particularly those uh, with disabilities who live in more rural communities um, or indeed who have family overseas, the virtual visits have proved to have been a lifesaver for them in terms of being able to connect with their family. So we intend to keep those and in-person visits both running. I call Melissa McHugh. Margaret, uh, I thank you, Minister, for your statement. Uh, just in relation to that as well, too, you had alluded to uh, COVID and how 
they have been very successful within the prisons in terms of its rollout, uh, or rather not in terms of its rollout, but in terms of its prevention. Uh, could you update us on we'll say, the vaccine rollout uh, in prisons to date, and what impact will that actually have on visits as well? Well, I think there are a couple of things. We continue with the prisons, um, at the Health and Social Care Trust continue to roll out the vaccine in prisons in line with the approach taken in wider society. So it is by age cohort. Uh, we now have a significant number um, of our prison officers, I think, um, have, been, have been vaccinated and also a significant part of the prison population. It is, of course, a factor in deciding how we relax um, visiting, but it is not the only factor because, of course, we know um, from recent reports that depending on the vaccine and a person's reaction to the vaccine, um, they, may still be, uh, they, may, they may still be vulnerable um, to COVID infection after that. So we need to proceed with caution. The most important thing for us is the health and safety of those people in our care. We take that really seriously and we hope that that reassures families. The prisoners have been incredibly cooperative with us during this period and we have managed to maintain open regime. So we haven't been in a situation where prisoners have been in lockdown 23 hours a day, as they have been in other parts um, of these islands. We have maintained a bubble system on each landing so that there is still association, there is still exercise and there is still education, albeit remote education ongoing. And I continue to work, for example, with the Department for the Economy to look for a day when we will be able to get in-person training and skills training back into the present system because we want to ensure that anyone who is in our care at this point in time is not in any way disadvantaged in terms of their rehabilitation outcomes. And that is the end of our period of time. of question to the Minister of Justice. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments uh, before the next item of business, which is the continuation of the debate before lunch.